Welcome to another episode on From the Table Podcast, a podcast brought to you by Martin First United Methodist Church. In this week's episode, we talk with Miss Alicia Pinto, a volunteer for the church, uh, a leader in the church, and a flight attendant, and the way that her job as she moves around the world uh, interacts with different people um, and has conversations and brings some of those stories back home, the way that that shapes her life as a volunteer and is seeing humanity united, though we are all different, uh, the way that we come together. Part of the episode was cut off at the end, and so we are giving you what we have from our conversation from the table. Enjoy. Welcome back to the table. We are here with Miss Alicia Pinto on episode seven on From the Table. How are you doing? Yeah. Doing well. So glad to be here with y'all today. Good, good, good. We are glad to have you. And we have some questions for you, Miss Alicia. Are you ready for to, to make some answers? Oh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> a little scary there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is episode number seven, episode number seven on uh, our podcast for the Church from the Table podcast. And we have here today one of our great friends and servants uh, who work alongside us, Miss Alicia Pinto. Uh, do you, did you have any nicknames growing up? Uh, not that like everybody called me, not like Christopher, who everybody calls him Pinto. Pinto Bean. Yeah. No, uh, one of my girlfriends, who's, her dad was minister of the church at the time, called me Leash. And then as I was, um, once I started flying, my roommate called me Lee, but for the most part, it's always been Alicia. Oh, yeah. wow. So short for Alicia, that's why you were called Leash, Leash. 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 or Lee. Leash or Lee. And when I was wow. in the theater, one of the guys called me Alicia, and I just thought I was too hot <laughs> to try it with Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> um, just tell us what you do normally for the church and outside of life. Well, my normal is not like most people's normal, I guess. Um, for the church, I um, am a part of our a greeting uh, team. That, that helps take care of the church on Sunday mornings to make sure that the church gets open and closed and, and things get done. Um, I also have the wonderful opportunity to teach the Godly Play class, which mm. is oh, a yeah. classroom or a, a, a class for kindergarten, first and second graders. So that's, I, I just thoroughly enjoy that. We are going on six years with that, I believe. Wow. If you had to just summarize that Godly Play in a, like a sentence or two, well, how would you? It's it goes along the Montessori way of doing things so that we sit around the floor. There are no chairs in there. There is a table that the kids can draw on, but we just sit around and tell stories and I don't use a book. I I have all these wonderful, um, like I have Noah's Ark and get to yeah. tell the story of Noah's Ark. I get to actually build the temple and the tabernacle and uh, to tell the stories of the parables. We have the different characters and we do it. So there's yeah. no reading and no, you know, you try to get the kids involved as much as you can. And when I can, I use taste, smell, obviously sight, um, and the sound of my voice. So we try to get all the senses. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's it's very well rounded, and and I think it keeps the t- the kids' attention a little bit better than just reading a story out of a mm-hmm. book and even right. showing oh, the pictures. Right. Yeah. yeah. Occasionally they get the stories get a little long and drawn out, and they're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I remember one time in youth we went in there, mm-hmm. and that was awesome. I I really liked it. Yeah. The guy, the guys, right? Wasn't yeah. That it? The guys, something group, like that. Oh, yeah. In there. Yeah. 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 I think uh, Christopher, when they were doing mm-hmm. it, and actually one time I think when I did it, it's, there's something about the room is just so relaxing just, yeah. because we never turn on the overhead lights. We mm-hmm. use just the the uh, floor lights right in the yeah. corners. Right, because so. that, that it makes the – whatever light is on, it makes it um, – it, it brings your attention to it. Yeah, and it just calms you down. And it calms you down. Because yeah, the whole idea is, is that the kids don't do a lot of roughhousing and crazy right, stuff in right. there. It's just a quiet space yeah. so that they can reflect and, yep. and learn. Right. And, and if they... anybody's listening to this, <laughs> it is a great uh, way to learn. And I've I, I've gotten to watch it. I've seen Miss Alicia do it. And then I've seen I've seen um I've seen it done uh, in other settings and it even as an adult, mm-hmm. it it it's awesome. It's 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 a really nice way to learn stories, uh, or to uh, get into a big group of well, not doesn't have to be big, but into a group of people where it could be hard to keep your attention. 
True. And you it's can do the nice thing about it is I don't have to plan for a certain number of people. Right. Because I can teach 25 in a big circle yep. or, you know, right now our, our class sizes are a little bit small right. because of COVID and things. So, you know, you can, even if you just had one child in there, yeah. you can still do it. Yeah. So it makes it, it very and multi-sensory. easy. Multi-sensory. It just, exactly. It, it, it like brings things more alive than it is to just say it. Right. And the kids have the opportunity to work with the, the stories afterwards because we, we have a story time and then we have what we call the response time. And that's when they can go take a story that they've heard. They have to have heard the story before they, they can't just go up to any story in the room right. and um, then, or they can do art, they can draw or paint or work with Play-Doh or just anything to try to help them process the story. Yeah. And all that artwork is kept in the classroom. We yeah. don't, we don't send it home every week because it's not for show and tell really. It's for the kids. Right to process. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and then we do, we repeat the stories every year. So in the fall, we do the mm -hmm. old Testament and then move into the new Testament. And then during the summer, I, I change out some stuff, but so that way they, over the course of the three years, if they miss a Sunday, they may miss it this year, but they happen to be there next year. So they, they have a chance to get all the stories in. That's the, yeah. that's the same thing we do in youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We go the same topic and we go back around right uh, yeah. every year and do it for three years. Cause what is that called? Um, is it sequential learning? I'm not sure. But it's, it's like it's like you don't learn the same. You don't learn something just once. Right. You'll forget yeah, it. Yeah. Right. So if you do it three times and repeat it, then yeah, there's then a better chance yeah, that you'll know it. Yeah. Better. Right. And especially now with the kids, sometimes every other weekend kind of things. You know, maybe one year it hits the weekend that they're gone and the right. next year it hits the weekend that they're yeah. here. So right. you have a better chance of covering everything and and yeah. getting all that information to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Well, that's that's one part of what you do. Yeah, yeah, it is. What uh, what else? What else? Yeah, Come well, on, tell us, tell us more. Tell um, me more. Tell me more. Well, my my um, my job, which is actually uh, something just that's fun to do, is I'm a flight attendant for United Airlines. Um, I've been here. 33 and a half years, which makes me seem so old and makes me seem so senior, but actually I'm a baby yes. because there are people that have been flying my entire life and I will soon be 57 years old. I had a purser back in uh, November and she'd been flying for 54 years wow. and still enjoyed the job. So I'm hoping that's the way I'll be because I'm based in uh, Washington, DC. So the hardest part of the job is just getting to work. Right. Uh, it makes for some long days. Long and yeah. <laughs> luckily, I've gotten to the point that I don't stress over it, but I either drive to Paducah and then fly from Paducah, Chicago to D.C., or I drive to Nashville and go straight. But right now it's getting a little weird because flights are being pulled because yeah. of COVID and other things, shortages of pilots and stuff. So what, what is when, when did when did the Paducah connecting flight to Chicago? Do you remember when that became? It's probably been about 10 years maybe okay. even longer than that so um, before that you just go straight to bna and yeah yeah and actually when i first moved to nash or to uh, martin we've been here it'll be 20 years in april it's hard to believe we've oh, been back wow. that long but initially i was doing a triple commute where i would drive to nashville and then have to go to dc and then on to uh, philadelphia because i was based in philadelphia oh, wow. so uh, life is definitely easier um so it's it's a crazy life, but it works, and at least I don't have to be in the car two days a week as opposed to people in the big city that have to drive back and forth, you know, right. an hour each direction every day of the week. Were so. you based in Philadelphia because there wasn't a a base in D.C., or is it just how it Actually, how it um, Christopher's dad, um, Christopher's my son, and his dad, Tony, um, we had met, we had met, we met in Chicago mm -hmm. and then we decided um, that Philadelphia would be a great place for both of us after we got married. So we uh, were in Philadelphia. Uh, Tony was a, the um, one of the coordinators at the flight attendant base. And so I just oh, okay. transferred mm -hmm. because he was there. Yeah. So we uh, lived there for about two years and then we moved to Nashville. Oh, okay. But I was actually based there for 15. I did not know you lived wow. in Philadelphia. Yep. I've wow. lived in Newark, New Jersey. And then Chicago, Philadelphia, actually uh, Claymont, Delaware, just right outside of Philadelphia, and then uh, Nashville, and then Martin. How how many of those were because of your job? All of them. Okay, all of them. <laughs> I didn't want to make assumptions. Yeah. <laughs> no, nope, no. Nope. I was I graduated from UTM in '87, uh, and I was very active with Vanguard Theater. So mm -hmm. I just knew I was going to go to LA and be an actress, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so after I graduated in May, somebody suggested Betty Hudson, bless her dear heart, uh, suggested, you know, why don't you be a flight attendant? And I was like, I don't know. I, <laughs> I'd only been on an airplane once and I was pretty green that time. Yeah. And so I, 
put out the resumes because you had to do it by mail back in the right. day because there was right. no computers. Right. Yeah. Or they were, we had computers, but not in that the way we do right. now. Right. Not in the sense yeah. of, of submitting an application. So um, I started working with Eastern Airlines mm-hmm. and uh, I wrote the girl that was with me on my first airline flight because I was the president of Anchor Club and you had oh, to go okay. to Valley Forge to a, a meeting. And I was so green and so scared. And she was like, it's okay. You know, we're just turning, we're just circling, we're just whatever. And I said, you're not going to believe what I'm doing for a living now. Uh, because it just seemed like as far away from anything as you could get. But right. so I did, I flew with Eastern Airlines for about um, a year and a half, just about. And the day before my birthday, um, we went on strike. And mm-hmm. so I worked at a rib joint in Brooklyn, which you can imagine <laughs> this accent in Brooklyn. And I was a terrible waitress. Um, but anyway, that happened for about three months. And then I got on with United in uh, June of 89. Wow. wow. Way, way, way before both of your times. Oh, yeah. Well, you're you're definitely our, our our church's resident of international travel. This is true. This is true. Uh, there's no yes. doubt about that. No, and that's so much fun. The whole time I was in in Philadelphia, I just thought I was not froofy enough to be international, and so I was happy uh-huh. being domesticated, as yeah, I shall sure. say. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But then Philadelphia closed, and that's what made me go to to oh, okay. Washington. They mm. closed the base, and so it took me about a year to get into the international gig, and now I just love it. What was I had? I had two questions around international. Sure. Um, what was your first international flight as a flight attendant? Okay. Well, technically speaking, I went to Jamaica with Eastern on one of my training flights. Okay. I think that's right. It's been a day or two since then. Um, and then um, I got, I was on reserve, which means you're on call. You don't know, you know the days you have off, but when you're on, you can go anywhere. And uh, they were short. At that point, we had an international base and a domestic base, and they were short international reserve. So they sent me to Frankfurt, Germany, So, which wow. is where I've been two out of the last three months. And then I was going to say, what was your last, what was your last place you were at? Frankfurt. Okay. Four times in the last two weeks. Wow. Two weeks. Yeah, okay. which is a lot. I mean, I usually don't do that much, but uh, my schedule had me going back and forth twice in one week, and then I got snowed out or snowed in, kind of a little bit of both, mm-hmm. and so I just picked up another trip and went back and forth. So, okay. lots wow. of Frankfurt. And what's some of the? Um, we were talking before we recorded this podcast. Uh, what are some of the differences you've noticed? particularly since we've all uh, brought up COVID and because COVID always will find its way in conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> always. Absolutely. What, what, are, what are some of the things you, 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 you see uh, in, terms of, in terms of your job as going to different countries? Uh, what are the, some of the, the differences or just some of the, some of the things that, that, that uh, become part of your life uh, in your work? Well, initial, well, it stopped about three months ago. In order to go to Germany, you had to get COVID tested prior to leaving the United States for crew. Our pilots are still doing it. I'm not sure exactly why they're not doing the flight attendants. So we'd have to go um, in early and get a test. You still have to do that if you're going to um, our African countries that we serve. Right. right. So um, so that's, that's one thing. And then, of course, when we're on the airplane, everyone has to wear their mask. So I'm... One of those people that goes around the airplane in the middle of the night and wakes you up and says, can you please put your mask back on or pull wow. it back up? And you hate to do it, but I mean, yeah. that's just what we've right. got to do to keep mm-hmm. us all safe. Right. So um, I'm like the medical profession, you know, once I put that thing on in the morning, I could have it on for 24 hours, give or take a, a minute or two when I'm yeah. eating. But um, yeah. so I'm not asking people to do something that I'm not doing. Right. And then, of course, um, each country is different. Um, I was in Germany for November, France for December and then back to Germany for January. And so in France and in Germany, you have to, we have a little app on our phone. So, um, I, when I was my first flight into Germany, I went to the pharmacy and showed them my vaccine card. And so they printed up letters that had a QR code for each one of the shots. And then you, you scan each one of those letters into the, the code or the app. So every time you go into a restaurant, definitely they look at it. And then just the last couple of weeks, it's gotten more stringent in Germany, where even just to go into a store, they have to, you have to show all this stuff. And so they have little tents set up where you can go get a bracelet like you would at a carnival. Yeah. And that way you don't have to get everything out every time you go into a store, because if you're, you know, in and out and in and out, that gets to be a little 
Was it kind of like screening before you go in? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because just making you, a separate space to do that. Well, yeah. I mean, you just you cannot get in the door. Right. Uh, right. Mean, it's like checking your ticket, right. basically. Yeah. Like if you're yeah. going into a movie theater, it's they they check it every single store except for the groceries. And I think that's just because people have to have some place that they can go to get, um, you know, food. Mm-hmm. And sure. there's so many people coming in and out, not like the the department stores and things where there's a little bit less traffic. Right. But everybody wears a mask, and you even see on the streets. Uh, most people still have their mask on. Wow. Uh, for one thing, I mean, it's been chilly. So, right. Oh, yeah. sure. Um, you know, yeah. It keeps you warm. Yeah, yeah, it does keep you warm. But once I put it on, you know, and getting the whole thing and not fogging up my glasses, I'd just rather just keep it on and not worry <laughs> yeah. about it. But also, you're, you're passing yeah. people. And, right, you know, right. I'm in a different country. And, and right now, um, right. they're raging as much, if not more, than we are. Mm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's a different life. And, of course, in the, the hotels, you have to wear your mask. Yeah. So, I mean, we... we I think especially around here, people would be very, very surprised. And, and nobody seems to fight it. They just do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, And also, wow. um, I know in Munich, you're supposed to wear KN95 masks. The cloth masks are not acceptable. But they've not... That's bug- the one I, I think this is the one I got. Yeah, it looks like it. So they've actually given us special masks that we can take with us to, to wear in Germany. Uh, we have our, our United masks that are cloth sure. mm-hmm. um, that we wear on the airplane. And they don't bug us when we're in the airport. Yeah. But... Uh, when I'm off the airplane, I wear a, a surgical mask, uh, yeah, or medical mask, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like medically approved or yeah, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. Just the regular approval rating or yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to make sure I don't. I mean, because actually, some uh, some of the flight attendants were, I can't remember. I, maybe they were in Munich, and the police actually came up to them and told them to put on another yeah. kind of mask. So yeah. I mean, wow. yeah, we uh, we get to take a lot for granted around here. Yeah. yeah, and you have to. You also have to learn. Has the regulation changed since I've last been back to this country? Or exactly. What, what am I walking into? Well, and <laughs> as a matter of fact, um, when we got um, two weeks ago on a Saturday night, we uh, canceled because we had a mechanical. And that next morning, they were starting where you had to have the three shots and they had to mm. show everything. So, I mean, just in a matter of leaving the hotel and going back to the hotel, everything wow. had changed. And actually, the hotel wasn't even, or the, the restaurant in the hotel wasn't even open. It was now just room service for that day. So, I mean, it's just wow. weird. Yeah. It's you really have to keep changed. up with stuff. So much just oh now mm-hmm. compared to, you know, what happened two years ago when it just started. Oh, you yeah. Know. I was there for that, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where, where where were you when? I was flying the night that the borders closed. I was going from D.C. to Zurich. And so by the time we landed in Zurich, they had everybody stay seated and they pulled everybody with a Swiss passport first. Then they pulled people with a European passport. Mm-hmm. And then that left us with the American passports. And from the time I walked to the back of the airplane to the front, they had reassigned us six times as to whether we were going back with the airplane or staying in Zurich. And we ended up staying in Zurich. And so then when we got back on the 19th, again, it was weird. They were screening every one of the passengers. They let the, they, they, I, I don't know exactly why, but crew tends to get, um, we don't have to go. I guess they know where we've been and everything. Right. So they, they aren't as strict with us as far as yeah. the testing and everything. So we were able to go on uh, okay. our merry way. And then after that, everything just shut down. Mm, wow. So the flights just, just ceased stopped. to exist. Yeah. yeah. Do you, in your, in your job as being, I mean, so close, like you're part of your job is customer service. And, oh, but it's like, very close customers. <laughs> very, yeah. very close. And, yeah. and, and in some ways where people are heightened in their stress and anxiety, mm-hmm. you know, customer service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say, I know there's been a lot of horror stories and I've had some people that, um, I've had to tell to put their mask on a couple of times. Mm. And after we've told you a couple of times, we hand you a card that explains exactly what's going to happen to you. If you do not mm, put your mask it. on or if we have to tell you again. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if you're from the United States, would you like to get back to the United States without having to swim? Um, yeah. So, um, but for the most part, I, I, everybody I've dealt with, and I think part of it too is just the way you approach it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of right. it, I just go up and you know touch my nose with you know, right, so they know that their mask is down or whatever. Right. And honestly, my people have been so good. I can't. I'm just so blessed to have such good passengers. Mm-hmm. Does it help? Does it help you particularly in in that in your work? Um, see humanity on a on a a, well on a more united level though there you know you you see people from all over the country from all over cultures all different cultures within different in the same country right different cultures you know does it does it help you kind of i don't know sympathize or 
feel, just feel more unified with 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 people, even though they could be speaking a di- different language or, or completely different, you know, contexts. Absolutely. I, I mean, I love Martin and the small town that I get to come back to because mm-hmm. I, I refer to this as Kansas. I'm Dorothy and I go to Oz <laughs> right. and Oz could be anywhere and I have to go over the rainbow <laughs> to get there. But, you know, seeing all these different people and the way different people live and everything, it really does. It gives you a much broader uh, realization of, of what's out there and also I think it does it does put us together because we, we realize that there are differences in customs and there are obviously differences in languages but we're all you know when it comes down to it we're all just human beings in, in the same boat right, right. So. thanks again to Alicia Pinto for joining us on From the Table podcast you can find Alicia's Pinto right where you're listening And also, if you're not listening on Anchor FM, you can listen to it on YouTube. Follow our church on social media, Facebook and Instagram, Martin First United Methodist Church. Thanks for listening to From the Table podcast. We'll see you this next Monday. Take care.